Good afternoon, everybody, again. Today, th at this time, we have Blair Wyatt, who has a background in software engineering and has just finished a master's degree of telecommunications engineering. He's worked in defence aerospace simulation and the tech industry since 2007. He spends his spare time reverse engineering network protocols for interoperability and e developing electronics. Uh, he relies on his cafe, coffee a fair bit yep. to grind through the early morning. <laughs> Thank you. Good everyone. Um, all right. Uh, I'm basically here to present SubPoz. Um, SubPoz is a dataless Wi-Fi positioning system. Um, I don't have anyone kind of working with me at the moment, so I guess I'm the creator and lead developer. But um, if anyone wants to help, please do. All right. So at the moment, hopefully the demo guards are watching today. Um, I did unfortunately hit a wombat the other day, so I think that's quite a good sacrifice. Um, the car's a little bit messed up, so I think that's uh, good penance. Um, if you do have Android on your, uh, an Android phone, you can download the demo APK. Um, trust me, there's not there's nothing nefarious going on. Sorry. Ah, uh, no, no, it's just uh, it, it, it's. It's just currently just on the on the SubPoz website. Um, it's a non-published APK at the moment. It's just a demo app, just to sh sort of show the API. I'll discuss that shortly. Um, but yeah, have a have a go if you if you're bored in the audience, um, and <laughs> hopefully break it. All right. So what is SubPoz? Um, SubPoz is an open source Wi-Fi positioning system standard that can be used anywhere GPS isn't. Um, and if you don't have data, perfect. Um, the initial concept sort of came about when I went in a, for a caving expedition, um, sort of wandering around the caves without much light and, and, and not knowing where you were. It was a bit of a sort of weird and scary experience, not knowing where you are underground somewhere. So I sort of decided, oh, wouldn't it be really cool to actually try and develop something that could solve this? Um, so it was essentially created to, to fill a gap in the market um, for open source positioning. Uh, and you also don't have to send your location to big data. You don't have to send your location to Google to figure out where you are. Um, plus, it's backwards compatible with pretty much every device. A um, couple of exceptions, but yeah. Uh, so the concept is how do you enable GPS-like location in subterraneous areas? Um, Subboss sort of came about from a Microsoft research paper that was, was about how to transmit um, data over Wi-Fi without association. Uh, they didn't actually mention any of the real applications of this, but I figured this is a perfect sort of idea um, for that particular uh, paper or purpose. Um, and yeah, you don't have to associate. You don't have to do anything. It just works. Um, so as I, as I said earlier, it, it's actually set up in this room. Um, each of the little nodes around the room is just transmitting beacon frames. That's all it's doing. Um, it also encodes their own position into the SSID to actually do, do the positioning. Um, and then on the client side, it'll then uh, use trilateration to determine its location. Um, this is the, the coding structure I've actually used to, to encode that information. Um, you, can, you can sort of see here that you, you, you've got sort of the lat long of the node uh, altitude. And um, there's also an application ID uh, set area or set of bits there that you can actually um, extend this with. So you can add more functionality to it, making it unique with the application ID um, and, and various other things, such as, for instance, the coding masks. Um, we'll discuss that shortly. Uh, one of the implications of this is you do need to set the, well, it is also backwards compatible with, with access points. Um, but if you, are, if you are looking to use it with an existing access point, you do need to set um, a minimum rate of one megabit a second uh, and 802.11b to actually make this work. Otherwise, the RSSI is not normalized. Um, there are other techniques you could use to not use RSSI, but that, that's sort of an extensible uh, part of it rather than um, just using, well, you, yeah. Uh, so what is SubPoz? Um, SubPoz is effectively just a standard for transmitting the, the position information via Wi-Fi for use in client-side trilateration. Um, there is no specific way you use, or there is no specific way you trilaterate your position from that, so you can kind of develop it any way you like. Um, this is purely just to send the data 
Um, as I said before, it's extensible. Um, and yeah, it's designed to be completely backwards compatible. What it isn't, it's not used for any client-side tracking. So if you're actually looking to find out where users are in the system, it, it won't do that. Um, it is a purely client-side thing, um, much like GPS. So if you were to actually wanting, if you were wanting to track users in, in a building like this, you'd actually need to develop a, an application which sent data back to to whomever. Um, and it isn't a, a calibrated positioning system, um, but. If you look around the room, those, those things are actually called the subpost node, um, and they kind of try and solve that by producing a standard set of hardware which will kind of work um, the same as, as every other one. All right, now this, this isn't really a marketing spiel. I didn't want it to be that. Um, it's, uh, it's more of a tutorial on how to go and design it rather than um, what it's all about. Um, so I'll, I'll explain some of the issues that I actually had kind of implementing this. Um, one of the major problems that you kind of have with a lot of access points and things like that is they don't necessarily meet the standards um, necessarily. Uh, for instance, the ESPH 6 module only allows 31 octets of information, um, primarily because some pro programmer probably thought, well, car SSID buff 32 is 32 characters, but you're not actually counting the, the termination character at the end. So I'm guessing that's probably the only reason why, just poor programming really. But a lot of devices are like that, and it's 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 quite surprising that they don't actually meet the the standard necessarily. Um, the, the yeah, um, one, one one of the main things is um, uh, rather anyway. I'll, I'll ignore that for a sec. Um, so apart from that, there's also other issues associated with, for instance, using the the Android API. Um, if you use the, the sort of get SSID value um, in, in the standard Wi-Fi sort of get client or get uh, access points API, it'll actually return Unicode. Um, and if you have any characters over ASCII sort of, or any, any over the ASCII character set, they'll return all these weird and wonderful Unicode encoded bits of octets of information. Um, oh, that, that's what I wanted to explain before. Um, generally with the Wi-Fi standard, it's not supposed to be treated, the SSID is not supposed to be treated as a string. It's actually supposed to be treated as a set of octets, but that never happens. Nobody ever does that. They always treat it as a string. For instance, in um, Windows, if you have a non-printable character in your SSID, it'll ignore it and won't even display it at all, which is relatively interesting. When I say non-human readable, sort of null characters and things like that. Um, but yeah, so, so in the Android API, you could kind of get around this using some of the hidden uh, API functions, um, there, there is the ability to sort of add that in there and get, get octet bits from, from uh, the Wi-Fi scanning uh, API, but that's not really great. I mean, developers don't really want to do that. They, they, they kind of want to uh, just use what's there and have it work. So instead of, I've, I've created the standard to eff effectively only use human readable or rather ASCII characters. Um, so the coding masks that I'll explain shortly will actually uh, encode all that information out and you don't have to worry about any special APIs or anything like that to, to make it work. Yeah, so difficult for developers to use and yeah, we just omit them. Um, the other thing is uh, some characters don't actually work in certain access points, like the ESP8266 module doesn't allow a line feed. Uh, quotes or, or pluses. Um, OpenWRT doesn't allow null characters or spaces in the SSID. They just don't work. Um, so that was another thing I had, to, I had to consider, and that was actually to encode the invalid characters out. So how do you kind of do that as well? You sort of go, well, um, why don't you just use, uh, why don't you just use sort of an existing coding standard like base 6.4 or whatever? That's the problem. You, you sort of, you can't kind of just use any sort of encoding scheme. You have to kind of go a bit, about a bit of a custom way because um, just stuff doesn't work sometimes. Um, so the, the coding masks themselves will actually, uh, uh, there's two of them. There's, a, there's an ASCII mask, which will uh, encode all of any characters over a, uh, hex 7F out. Um, and also invalid character mask is if, if you, if a character exists in a, an invalid list of, of um, uh, characters, get rid of it. Um, 
there is there is a little bit of a caveat to that though. If two characters exist next to each other in the ASCII uh, character set, it, it just that access point is no longer supported. But from what I've found, um, generally they're kind of all sort of pretty random and around the place. So you don't generally get one character and another character next to each other causing problems. So I like to say it, it works in about say 90% of existing access points, but um, I don't know, yet to be seen, I suppose. Yeah, so why don't we just use strings or, or anything like that? Um, well, you could, but you don't get much information in there. As you saw, there's a stack of stuff you can actually end up storing in, um, in SSID if you, if you go about it the right way. Um, and, and as I said, like some characters just are invalid, uh, the plus, for example. When I say that the characters, I mean everything's treated as octets, but um, generally when you sort of try and input that information into the access point, um, like i.e. The, the, the text box in a web GUI, for example, it just won't accept it, it'll just parse it out, it'll get rid of it. Um, so one of, the, one of the parts, or rather I've, I've created a, 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 a git, git repo of all of this, um, I've, I've lovingly called it the, the suppository. Um, make, of, make of it as, a, as you wish. Um, and part of that is, is an Android API that allows you to get your position uh, on your Android phone, which is, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, I've made it so it's easy to use. You can actually just uh, import the code, um, create an activity, and then use a get position call to, to actually get your position. And it'll do it instantly. Um, the, the trilateration usually takes maybe about 20 milli, uh, sorry, 200 milliseconds or so to calculate. The scanning maybe takes about two seconds or so. Um, but from then, it just, just sort of keeps working. Uh, and, and you get basically that, essentially. Um, I will skip this part, but... So as, as I said before, um, Around the room, there's, a, there's a, a device called the Subpos node. Um, it, was, it was actually introduced to kind of create a, a standard, uh, calibrated sort of beacon source um, for positioning. Um, uh, it does offer extra features now in the current revision three. Uh, it has a nice, really easy to configure USB uh, to UART menu structure. You can go in and and uh, set all the parameters. Um, it, it offers USB firmware updates and other little features like frequency shifting, for example. Um, that's sort of what the, the node ends up looking like. Um, you can have a look at them shortly. Um, one of the cool things about this particular setup is, is I, I've done extensive testing with it. And, and um, here's a little sort of test setup. If you can see it, I don't think you can. But essentially, it's just a little car park. Uh, eight nodes situated around and I performed a whole bunch of measurements uh, on that. And from that, uh, look, this is a very broad uh, claim, but you can get up to half, half, plus or minus half a meter of accuracy through just RSSI measurements. Now, something like that would not necessarily work very well in a room that's filled with stuff. Um, you do get a lot of error with things like that, but implementing extra functionality, which I'll talk about later, like time of flight, um, hope, we'll hope to eventually solve that um, and there's sort of frequency hopping there. So if you've got, got 802.11b running, um, you've sort of got about 20 megahertz of bandwidth per channel. Um, you can then spread this out to about 80 megahertz of bandwidth um, to kind of reduce any uh, multipath effects or um, just, just to basically increase diversity uh, to give you a slightly better result or position rather. All right, let's hope that poor Wombat uh, was a good sacrifice. Um, Just uh, see if this runs. Bam, there we go. All right, so um, I've just got uh, my smartphone here. It just has the demo app installed. Um, just sub pause monitor. Same sort of thing you'll have if you install it yourself. As you can see, that's the GPS position we've currently got. And it just sh shortly updated then with the actual position there. So uh, as you can see, you can, it sees all the nodes, and then it sees your position as well from that. Um, the trilateration algorithm on this particular demo is a little bit relaxed, and it will kind of just average out a lot of stuff. So you can, you can get a little bit of movement around the room, but generally it'll just give you a very coarse position in a room. Um, I'm looking to kind of develop further sort of uh, different, different things to make that better, um, and I'll talk about that shortly. 
Okay, so what doesn't work at the moment? Um, basically, one of the biggest issues with this, and it's kind of one of the reasons why I didn't kind of make a million bazillion dollars out of it and decided to open source it instead, was the fact that the, the iOS uh, platform does not allow you to use any of the private APIs, which Wi-Fi scanning is unfortunately part of that. Um, Apple will not allow you to put anything in their app store that uses any private APIs anymore. Um, if you are a business, however, you could, for instance, dis distribute those apps via the uh, uh, enterprise distribution system that they have, um, which could allow you to use it for your, your workers or whatever, but um, it's not necessar necessarily useful so for, say, people in a store or, or whatnot. But hopefully, at some stage, maybe they'll bring that back in. But it is quite unfortunate that that is one of the, 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 the key sort of things that don't work. Um, but that's the only one I've found that it doesn't actually work with. Okay, so a bit of the future work that I'm looking to kind of push on with is um, I'm kind of trying to create a, a pure RF solution rather than using the ESP8266 modules. Um, one of the reasons for that is the, the, the source code to that is very limited. Uh, you don't get access to a lot of the low level uh, functionality of the, the Wi-Fi driver in there. Um, one of the, the cool things about this too, it'll allow you to have sort of extra, uh, be, be able to let you do more things with it basically, i.e. time of flight, et cetera. Um, and it'll be sort of offer lower power as well. Uh, there is a config mode that I'm developing at the moment which will allow you to remotely configure the nodes once they're installed. Um, you'll be able to just push a new, new config to it if need be. Um, that's kind of one of the issues with it at the moment. It does take a little bit of setup to, to, to sort of plug everything in, configure via USB and roll it out. But um, something like this would actually solve that um, and allow you to sort of just configure it remotely. Uh, I'm developing a subpos receiver, which you could use with, with time of flight to actually control an, uh, a drone or, 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 or whatever. Um, I'm not trying to necessarily compete with other systems out there, such as the DecaWave system. Uh, it's more just an alternate to that, and, and plus you get the additional backwards compatibility. So if you set this up for uh, a, a drone or whatever, you could still also use your, your smartphone to get coarser positioning from that as well. So you don't kind of have to use just time of flight. You don't just have to use a receiver. It can kind of work with everything, um, but you'll just get better stuff if for, for things and that may want to use it. Uh, rooms earnings, another one um, that'll sort of allow you to kind of walk between rooms and, and, and know that you're in a different room. Um, these, these sorts of spaces could be sort of as low as four by four meters, for example, and it'll work quite effectively. Um, essentially, as you walk around, you'll know that you're in the new room. Uh, for instance, finding this uh, OSDC conference was a bit of a bit of a trek sometimes. If you walked over the other side there, you didn't know where you were. You're trying to figure yourself out, figure your way through the building. Um, this would tell you where you were exactly in each room. It would say, you're in this room, you're in this room, you're in this room, um, and give you sort of rough positioning as, as well inside there. Um, so improving the, the, the trilateration positioning API in the, in the Android and et cetera libraries, um, dead reckoning would actually allow you, will give you sort of better path accuracy. Um, uh, I've got another sort of trilateration uh, algorithm in the works, which, which hopefully will be better. Um, I'm just currently using one that's available, uh, developed by another, another individual. Um, and also to give sort of error circle indication, much like Google Maps does, to say, oh, you're kind of within this space. Because um, at the moment, it just spits out a, a position. Um, and just another one uh, someone suggested to me a little while ago was to sort of have them self-learn so you could actually grow the network or grow the uh, uh, cluster, essentially, to, to add more, more um, nodes into it to allow you to sort of populate an area. Uh, more easily. Um, I guess that goes hand in hand with the, the configuration mode as well. Um, but yeah. Now this goes back to the whole point of um, using it in caving. Uh, for example, that you could you could actually use these as a breadcrumb sort of trail as you went through an area, dropping them around. Um, just a little battery powered thing, drop it around, walk through. Um, as you drop them through, you, you just put it on a topo map of some sort to um, sort of indicate here it is. And then you could find your way back by sort of knowing that you're, you're approaching the next one, next one, next one, um, and pick them up as you go back as well if you wanted to, uh, to, to sort of find your way through caves if you like. But um, 
I don't know how useful that would be, but still fun nonetheless. Um, okay, so why subpos? Um, as I said, designed to be backwards compatible. Uh, pretty much every device that I've managed to come across, except for iOS devices. If you do have a, a jailbroken phone, you can do it on a jailbroken phone. It's just that it doesn't allow you to do it um, on a non-jailbroken iPhone. Uh, very fast acquisition time. So one of the biggest issues you have is if you're using, say, Google's location, Wi-Fi location, it does take a little, a little while to actually determine your position. Um, whereas this will get you your position within a Wi-Fi scan period on, on your device. So you, you, can, you can quite quickly uh, determine where you are. Um, alongside that, low location latency is actually another major factor. Um, when you do get your position through a, a, an external service, you've got to scan, send the data, wait for that to calculate, send it back, and that can be up to sort of five to 10 seconds in some instances, um, depending on which system you're using. Uh, so you, you, you can sort of know where you are quite instantly, much like GPS, essentially. And no data connectivity. That's the, probably the biggest thing about this, all, this whole project is you don't need to actually sort of tell anyone where you are. You, you can be private. You can be, if you want, you can, you can go about this and, and not let anyone know where you are, um, unless you want to, I suppose. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And any feedback? Um, the caving example makes me immediately think, how do you, do you handle 3D position? It, it does handle 3D, 3D positioning, yes. Um, cool. It's, it, it, uh, for the most part, your accuracy is as good as as many nodes as you have. So if you've got one node in a room, you, that's, a, that's, a, that's as good as you're going to get. You're going to know that you're in that room. Um, if you have sort of a node in every corner, you will be able to work out 3D positioning. Mind you, um, it is using receive signal strength, so that can change per device, and, and I wouldn't rely on that as a sort of very accurate positioning system, um, but it gives you a very reasonably decent course uh, system, at least equal to what Google would offer, for example. Um, cool. But the, the time of flight system kind of would give you 3D position and better accuracy at the same time. And have you looked at um, I've done experiments on how many, like, as you increase beacon size, do you get, sorry, beacon, the number of beacons available, do you get more accuracy and so forth? Yes. Is there a sort of optimum point? Uh, I'd, I'd say, so, so the, the measurements that I've done are sort of with usually eight. Um, it's a little bit overkill, to be honest, um, but that would give you that half metre of accuracy, although that is in a, in a space that's quite... Um, uh, sparse uh, in a room with a lot of uh, stuff around, a lot of reflection effects, you aren't going to get that accuracy. You never will. Not with Wi-Fi anyway. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'd say about four is reasonable in a room to sort of give you rough, rough position. Um, for the most part, I think if a business was ever going to roll this out, they would augment their existing access point. And the, the access point might be a per room access point or, or whatever part of the building. Um, so you would give it, it would give you a rough position always, and a reasonably uh, a useful position at least. Um, two hopefully quick questions. The first is, how many uh, museums and galleries have you pitched this to as a uh, hit stuff that's around me sort of app? Um, the second one is uh, technically, like, could, what are you thinking of to make a transmitter device that's not say a access point, maybe like a cheap version of a hack RF or something that just sort of pings out the the Packets only. Uh, th that's these, just to answer your second question. The, the, around this room is, is exactly that. Um, it is just a, a self-contained device. Um, you can uh, do this completely on a sort of very cheap Internet of Things type uh, chipset of some sort. The ESP8266 is a good example of that. Um, these use that exact chipset. Um, they. Uh, essentially allow you to run it in access point mode and transmit an SSID and send a position. Um, to answer your first question, none so far. I, did, I was about to approach uh, the, the company that does all of the, the kiosk systems in shopping centres and things like that. Unfortunately, in my email I was writing, and it works on this and this and this and this and, and it, iOS as well. Better check that. 
did some research, went, uh-oh, doesn't do that. Um, and I figured you sort of almost lost, I guess, people shopping at a shopping center, say, 30% of your market share. Yeah, well, it, it, exactly. Um, one, one of the one of the things that, that, that sort of occupied my time more with this project is I've actually, or had it entered in the Hackaday Prize uh, this year. I, I managed to make the semi-finals, but not the, not the not the finals for that. But it's also part of the the best product category, which it gets announced next week. So crossing fingers. But um, uh, other than that. Um, I, I haven't been pushing it as much as I should probably have been. Um, more finishing uni off at the moment, so it's been a bit crazy. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. I might have, I apologise if I did miss this, but did you, um, how does it compare with the low Bluetooth positioning stuff? I know that. Actually, I was just looking at your wiki page just now because yep. I was looking for the APK and I, I see that you said. Beacon may be a reason for uh, uh, Apple blocking your access to those Wi-Fi points. So just what is the sort of comparison with iBeacon and those well, things? Well, the main comparison with this is uh, it, it is a Wi-Fi based system. So you do get uh, sort of effectively a longer range. Um, in, in terms of that, though, as, as I said before, it, it is dependent on how many you, you roll out. Um, like you can roll them out all in this room and you will see it anywhere in the room. Whereas with uh, lo uh, low energy Bluetooth, it may sort of only see sort of a few meters away, if that, depending on what sort of transmit signal strength they send it at. Um, one of the big things though, is a lot of the implementations for, for iBeacon and, and uh, et al, they, um, they all still require kind of a database connection to work because um, they don't transmit the position of the device, they just send an ID. So you sort of need to go, oh, what is that? I, I'm, I'm seeing these IDs, where are they? Um, so you kind of still need that database connection, and this is more of a solution to, to that, in a sense. Um, while I could actually add that to the iBeacon standard, it would be really cool if they did, or if people actually started utilizing that sort of functionality. Um, I think they'd probably do it more in a, an associated sense, so they'd have to connect to the device, figure it out, and transmit it back. Um, I'm not sure whether they can stuff kind of that much information in the, in the, the Bluetooth uh, management frames, but um, maybe they could. It's just probably a change of the standard that they'd require rather than, than not, because um, yeah, you, you still need to kind of get that data to the user somehow. And in that sense, you are connected, so you're still kind of connected to the, the system, whereas this is purely passive. It doesn't require any of that. It just sees it. data provenance. The first thing I think of is how much fun it would be to come in with a bunch of devices and trick people into thinking they're on level two instead yep. of level three. <laughs> or So have you thought about how you can get this sort of security uh, data integrity into the system? I guess, I guess you've got the same issues with any, any um, sort of Wi-Fi based uh, system. You can trick Google into thinking that you're in wherever uh, by creating a whole bunch of access points with similar SSID, BSSIDs as somewhere else, um, and it will think that you're there. Uh, it does ignore it to some extent, but um, essentially, no, you, you could just wipe it out if you liked. But hopefully something like that would be rather temporary. I mean, you can always disable Wi-Fi networks by just smashing out whatever sort of RF uh, spread spectrum type something or other to, to kill that sort of stuff too. So it comes down to kind of people being reasonable, I suppose. But that's, that's always not the case. <laughs> yes, it's always um, not the case. Um, but I, I think that um, from my point of view, you know, a system like this would be dead in the water unless you could um, have some sort of strong cryptographic guarantees about yeah. the, the data integrity in the system. So uh, anyway, I'll get off my soapbox now. If you want to talk about public key infrastructure for these devices, Come and see me. I guess, I guess, look, it is definitely something that would be uh, useful, I suppose. But I suppose the main issue you've got is trying to pack that sort of information into the frames themselves. Um, in any sense, I think you'd probably want to roll this out in, say, a shopping centre or something like that, where people coming, are coming and going. If, if there is a temporary, uh, if, if someone does temporarily sort of transmit a, uh, or set up an access point with a phone with the the, the correct information to screw it up a bit. Hopefully it's temporary um, rather than sort of permanent. I guess you could leave a battery powered device somewhere for a period of time. The trilateration algorithm does, however, um, 
average a lot of that out. So you can send, you can say, oh, I'm all the way over here. That is another thing with the room zoning. Um, you will be able to filter out things that are far away um, and sort of ignore things that are a bit erroneous. Uh, so you just, you just do that essentially with the, the, the API. Um, yeah, just get rid of stuff that's kind of outside, um, outside the, the, the curve essentially. You, you just ignore it. Um, but yeah, it, it does become a problem, but it's not practical. I think that's probably the main, the main aspect of it. But yes, yeah, you definitely could. <laughs> um, what's the sort of order of magnitude cost of these little uh, transmitters? Um, the, these, are, the, these have just been designed as a sort of business-friendly solution, essentially. Um, I, I've gone through a few iterations, but I've, each, iter each iteration you sort of design more. You think, oh, that'd be cool to put this and this and this in. Um, I've managed to create these for about a retail price of about, not a bulk order price, of about $12, including the printed circuit boards. Um, I'd say if you, if you were to sell these, you could probably get them under 20 Australian dollars very easily. Um, but you can do it with existing infrastructure. You don't have to use one of these. Um, as I said, you can use the SPH6 6 module by itself. You just need to power it, um, and then you can use it. Uh, that's the beauty of it. You don't have to purchase these. I just figured it's a nice product of some sort. <laughs> Well, there's no further questions. It's thank you to Blair. I'll duck out the back and get his memento. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think this might have been interested me.